opening presentation this morning, we have Jay Ham. Jay is in the Soil and Crop Science Department at Colorado State University. He's a, what was it, an agricultural micrometeorologist, and he's going to talk to us about where he gets to work in the beautiful Rocky Mountains measuring ammonia emissions. Jay? Well, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to Colorado. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here today and uh, to talk about many of the things that are important in this conference. And, and like Rick said, I think a lot of the things that you guys work on are really, really important, not only at the farm scale or regional scale, but they're very important at international scales, and I'll try to demonstrate that. I'm going to talk a little bit about ammonia and air quality associated with livestock. You know, during my career I've seen when we first started working on livestock almost everything was water quality oriented and now we're seeing much more emphasis on air quality over the last 10 years and we're going to continue to see more of that. Anytime you talk, I'd like to first maybe acknowledge some folks with my group. Um, got a really good team here working with me. I have, we have been fortunate to get a lot of funding from different agencies and like to thank them and my, also my uh, cooperators and industry partners. You'll also hear some, if you attend the air quality session later this morning, members of the Rocky Mountain National Park Agricultural Subcommittee on Air Quality, which is also a very uh, wonderful group of people that are trying to, uh, to address these ammonia issues here along the Front Range. Now, anytime you talk about air quality, you have to think about scale, okay? We're either talking about global air quality issues, regional or local issues. So I'm going to start off talking about some more global issues because those may be some that you're not fully aware of. Talk about our regional Rocky Mountain National Park issue and then finally get into more farm scale solutions. But I'm going to have to be pretty brief on all of these because a lot of these topics are going to be discussed later on in the conference in great detail. So what about the global nitrogen cycle? And uh, our issue always with nitrogen in our livestock systems is we put a lot of nitrogen into the system, but we you know, don't get a lot of nitrogen out in our product. We're not very efficient. And a lot of that's not our fault. We're, a lot of effort is put into improving efficiency. A lot of it's just driven by the biology of the animals themselves. But because of that, we have a lot of leakage. We have a lot of fugitive nitrogen that leaves our system and gets into the air or the water. And that's the fundamental problem. And earth scientists, people that look at global nitrogen, are becoming more and more interested in this all the time. We started seeing a lot of work on this at the Earth System scale mobe in the mid-2000s. And a paper that came out that was particularly interesting was the work by Rockstrom. And you may have seen uh, more popular versions of this uh, in the literature. And what Rockstrom did was get together a bunch of Earth System scientists and try to define a safe operating space for humanity. And they uh, looked up, or they defined nine different environmental issues that they thought the Earth System was facing. You can see those listed on the outer periphery of the circle. Now, and then they define an area in the center that they thought was the safe operating space. That's the green circle. And then starting at the center, they tried to figure out, using ecology and data, world-scale data, how far outside the operating limits we might be. And you can see at the very top one, you see the, the climate change uh, bar. And it's definitely outside the safe operating space. And there's going to be a lot of discussions here about livestock and climate change. But look at the two other bars. Uh, biodiversity, much farther outside the safe operating range. And livestock is sometimes implicated in that, especially with land use change. And then nitrogen. Okay, Nitrogen is actually much farther outside the safe operating range than, than CO2 or greenhouse gases. If you listen to Rockstrom talk about this, He's got a very nice TED talk if you'd like to, uh, to watch it. He says, oh, you think the climate change problem's tough? The nitrogen problem's much more difficult, much more difficult than climate change. And why does he say that? And a lot of us know, might kind of have an inclination of the answer. It's because, why is nitrogen a problem? It's because we're fixing so much nitrogen out of the air, taking non-reactive nitrogen through the Haber-Bosch process, 
converting it to fertilizer and injecting it into our ag systems, a lot of it going through livestock. And if you look at the data on that, a large portion of the Earth's population is sustained on yield gains that we get from nitrogen fertilizer, okay? So how can you back up from that? How can you say, oh, we've got to reduce the Earth's population by 45 percent? Not going to happen. A, a kind of complementary paper that came out about the same time with Erzman's paper, if you look at the um, well, pointer is going to work here. You can see that, you know, if you start about 1960, that's when stuff's really started to happen. We had massive increases in fertilizer use. And uh, going way up uh, from the baseline levels. During that same time, population increased from about 3 billion to where we're crossing about 7 billion now. So just in my lifetime, we've seen a huge increase in population and fertilizer use. And you can see the dashed line there represents the fraction of the Earth's population that they think are sustained by the use of nitrogen fertilizers. It's up almost to 50 percent. Okay. That's why Rockstrom says nitrogen is such a big issue. The point I wanted to make to this group, about this time we started seeing people link this nitrogen issue to livestock and meat production. You can see the green line there is meat production also increasing during the same period. People's demand for protein really increased and we see a large increase. So we start seeing the first inclinations that the global nitrogen problem is somehow linked to livestock. More recently, just a couple of months ago, a new report came out, a UNEP report called Our Nutrient World. And it's a very good report in my opinion. If you want to read it, I encourage you to read it. There's a lot of good information in there. But this is in the executive summary. And I normally don't read my slides, but I'm going to read this one. Globally, around 80% of the harvested nitrogen and phosphorus is consumed by livestock rather than directly by people, showing how global nutrient supply and pollution are dominated by humans' choice to consume animal products. Okay, so there might be some groans out there. First, they wrapped their livestock on the climate change issue, wanting, you know, we started seeing the meatless Mondays and all that kind of stuff. Now there's a, a coming at it from the nitrogen angle, okay? One of the positive things, though, in the report is this was the recommendation, and this is a good group of scientists. I'll, I'll mention that Mark Sutton is an air quality scientist that's worked on, uh, on ammonia most of his career. But these are the three recommendations, and you look at the two of them. One is improving nutrient use efficiency in animal production, and one is increasing fertilizer equivalence value of animal manure. This was an international team of scientists, most of them not ag scientists. This is what their main recommendations were from the report on dealing with nitrogen from an ag issue. So again, we're seeing the importance of a lot of the things that are, people do in this room, um, being a lot more attention being drawn to it at an, at an international scale and global scale. So I think that was a really positive thing of the, in the report. Now, Unfortunately, about the same time the report came out, we saw a plethora of new press come out on the demetarian option. I don't know if you're aware of that. The concept of a demetarian is someone who eats, you try to reduce your meat consumption to half of its previous amount. Okay, demo meaning coming from having. Now, so again, linkages between nitrogen use and uh, and uh, food choice. And I was pretty interested in this because the scientists that, that worked on this, and this was a coin also termed by, uh, coined by Mark Sutton, I was pretty interested in this because I was saying, why is this group of scientists, which I have a lot of respect for, all of a sudden so interested in livestock and meat production and this being a big part of their plan to reduce the Earth's nitrogen issue? Um, so I went back and read the Barsac Declaration and, and looked at the conference where that was developed. And this was back in 2009 when they wrote this document. And, you know, if you look at that, their, their scientific rationale behind why meat consumption should be reduced, the, the rationale is, okay, when you take nitrogen that's in, the, in foodstuffs or in grain or forages and you route it through the livestock system, you, one, increase the opportunity for losses of nitrogen to the atmosphere or to the soil or to the water, and often you convert the nitrogen to more mobile forms, okay? 
And you know, as an agricultural scientist, I thought I looked through their list of rationale, and it's not really unreasonable. Okay, they're thinking about that. Okay, we do increase opportunities for losses to the to the uh, environment when we work with livestock, and we do increase mobility a lot of the time. I guess one thing I ar would argue with them about is there are other solutions than just changing people's diet, right? And that's what the people in this room work on, right? We do spend a lot of time developing technology and techniques to reduce that leakage to the environment, okay? And so there are other ways to uh, reduce this livestock impact on the Earth's nitrogen cycle. But I wanted to talk about this a little bit because this is really, has really emerged uh, more recently. If you look at the global ni nitrogen fluxes in livestock uh, ammonia, if you look up there at the, at the nitrogen fertilizer fixing that we're doing, we're fixing 120 teragrams of nitrogen per year on a worldwide scale, and that more than doubles the natural fixation of uh, nitrogen from the air uh, that would occur naturally. See there at 60. So you can see why the Earth System scientists are so concerned about Haber Bosch, nitrogen fertilizer, livestock. So, and then when they go down there, they say, where does all this nitrogen go? They attribute a lot of it as being routed through livestock production, okay, that 100 teragrams of grass, crop and grasses for livestock are headed into livestock stream. And that's a little bit misleading because a lot of that forage is right in hay and grass. Somebody here probably should write an editorial a little bit on that because it's not like every gram of nitrogen in all of our grain, 80% of it heads into the livestock stream. So you see that 80% number thrown around a lot, and it sounds kind of ominous that 80% of everything that we grow as agronomists goes into livestock. It's not really true. Um, but ammonia emissions from soils are, a lot of that nitrogen ends up in the air as form of ammonia, uh, 15 teragrams from soils, and this is mainly fertilizer, and then 22 from livestock. So we see here that for ag ammonia emissions, livestock account for about 60%. And you know, you can look at a lot of different inventories done at different scales. A lot of the time we find that when it comes to ammonia emissions into the air, livestock's accounting for 50 to 60% a lot of the time. And why do we have a lot of ammonia in the air? A lot of it's just, again, the biology of the animal itself. And the beef system, that's what I'm going to focus on mainly today is that you have a lot of re you don't have a lot of retention of fed nitrogen a lot of us work on that and um, so you end up with just a tremendous amount of urea on the on the surface uh, mo most of it in the urine some of it in the feces it can rapidly convert to ammonium and convert uh, uh, then uh, to ammonia gas and be lost to the atmosphere and uh, there's a lot of different groups around the country, including our own, that are showing that, you know, a lot up to 50% of the fed nitrogen can be lost to the atmosphere as ammonia, sometimes even more. There's going to be some talks on this tomorrow. I know Rick Todd and Andy Cole, others are going to talk about this, and they have some good data on this as well. But that's a lot of nitrogen. You know, if you look at where the beef cattle industry is in the United States, it's, it's mainly here in the Great Plains. If you draw that imaginary line between Amarillo, Texas and Garden City, Kansas, that's my old stomping grounds. I, my family was originally from Garden City, Kansas. My father was a feedlot manager there. So I've spent a lot of time in that beef belt. And there's a lot of animals in there. You've got about 9 million animals. You also see another hot spot or another concentration of animals up there around uh, the Denver area, Greeley, Fort Morgan, where we are now. All this is a pretty mature industry. You know, a lot of development in the 60s and 70s. But you just put a basic back of the envelope calculation to this. You have about nine and a half million head, and we know about what they excrete, and we know 50% is lost to the atmosphere. You're looking at maybe one and a half to 1.7 million pounds of ammonia per day just coming off of these nine million head here in the United States. Staggering amount. Just this beef system here could be accounting for maybe 40 to 50 percent of all ammonia losses from livestock systems for the whole United States. Okay, so this beef system, when you think about ammonia, it's this beef feedlot system that really gets a lot of attention. And you can even see this from space. And, and I'll encourage all of you to watch for new developments with satellite technology. This is a really hot area of research. There's a bunch of new satellites going up that can measure the ammonia in the air column above the Earth. 
And it's quite interesting. Some of my colleagues at Harvard, Colette's now at Harvard, they can see these air columns of ammonia over our livestock producing regions, okay, on some days. You can, you can some, this one doesn't show it quite as well, but sometimes the red dots are just right over, right between Amarillo and Garden City, okay, right there. And, of course, the California, uh, Gary area also shows up a lot of the time. And this is probably going to be a nice new tool for a lot of us in this room, even at a real practical level, because it gives us a way to sort of survey what's going on with time. Now, let's... Let's move more to Colorado and talk about nitrogen deposition in Rocky Mountain National Park. And when I say nitrogen deposition, I'm talking about when you get ammonia into the air, it moves from the point of origin to some other location, and then rain or snow scavenge that nitrogen out of the air back to the surface. Okay, it's a form of sort of fertilization. And what we have here in Colorado is kind of this perfect storm scenario. What's the storm being that you have a combination or confluence of many different uh, uh, factors that come together to sort of aggravate the situation, okay? So here's a map, the map showing Denver, where we are now. A rapidly growing urban population and metro area with a lot of air pollution, mainly driven by uh, mobile sources, coal-fired generators, etc. Then we have our Rocky Mountain National Park, very close by, blue circle. Rocky Mountain National Park's a crown jewel, one of the crown jewels of the park system. It's very, very important to Colorado for many different reasons, both economically and others. And then up around Greeley, Fort Morgan, we have this very mature ag region, okay, with a lot of feedlots, a lot of dairies, and a lot of ag production and crop production. And they all three interact. I'll also add down at the bottom, you see a, a, a drilling rig. We also have a tremendous amount of oil and gas development in here at the same time, and that creates another form of pollution that also interacts with the system. So it's sort of this oil and gas, livestock, ag, Denver Metro, all really close to a pristine class one area. Okay, and, and all of us care about that. That slide in the upper left, I'm a big fly fisherman. I'm up in the park all the time fly fishing. Um, we all care about that. We all want to protect it. But there's been a lot of press about how nitrogen deposition in the park is having an adverse effect. And producers in, along the Front Range are very aware of this. Uh, and because of this, there was a plan developed called the Rocky Mountain National Park Nitrogen Reduction Plan. And Phyllis Woodford and other folks are going to talk about this more during the air quality session. And how EPA and the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment and the Park Service work together with producers to develop plans to reduce the impact. It's a pretty impressive story about how this is happening. But producers in Colorado are certainly very aware that there's this, uh, of course, they've got a big urban population that doesn't know much about ag, and this is the information that they're getting, that, that uh, livestock might be hurting their, their park. Why do they think that, or why are folks so interested in that? We have a lot of ammonia sources along the Front Range not only livestock, but a lot of different sources. Nitrogen, both oxidized nitrogen and reduced. It goes up into the atmosphere. And an important concept to understand is that maybe we have ammonia leaving, leaving our facilities, but as soon as it's up into the air column, it interacts with other molecules many times to form aerosols, converts from a gaseous form to a particle. Okay. And it can even move in and out of cloud droplets. And this is a real dynamic process. It can be a solid and move back to a gas, gas to liquid, back and forth. But once it's in that aerosol form, it can travel tremendous distances, okay, and then be redeposited through dry or wet deposition. That's what's depicted on the right. And it's that deposition of nitrogen up in Rocky Mountain National Park or other pristine alpine areas that is such a concern. So you get sort of this cycling where you've got all these complex sources along the Front Range moving up into the atmosphere, chemical transformations, the airstream moves out over the park or other pristine areas, you get rain or snow, you get this sort of nitrogen fertilization effect. How do we measure wet deposition? Uh, this shows uh, some of our work up in the park. It's one nice thing about um, working in this area. One day we're out at a feedlot or dairy, the next day we're up in the Rocky Mountain National Park. And uh, here you can see one of our wet depth samplers. It's basically a bucket with an automated lid on it. There's a special precipitation uh, sensor. When we start seeing rain or snow, the 
lid comes off of the bucket, the bucket collects uh, the liquid, when it stops raining it covers it and we go out and collect that. And that allows us to measure how much nitrogen came down in the precipitation. And uh, these data are being collected by a lot of different folks. This is the data on the long-term wet nitrogen deposition in Rocky Mountain National Park. Look at the focus on the red line there. You can see that basically uh, over the last 10 or 15 years there hasn't been much change in the rate of deposition. And uh, that it's up there around 3 kilograms of N per hectare per year. And it hasn't changed much. Now those of you that work with a lot of nitrogen management go, three kilograms per hectare per year, that is a teeny amount of nitrogen, right? I mean, we're talking, you know, pounds per acre, yeah, probably less than three pounds per acre on a lot of years. And you go, how can that really be having an impact on the ecology of the park? And, uh, but it does, because if you go up into the park, some of you probably have spent some time in the mountains. When we say the soils in the park, the soil is not soil like we think of. I mean, right, it's a thin layer of material on top of rock. So when you get those three pounds of uh, nitrogen per year coming down uh, on the system, it doesn't really get absorbed or it just rapidly moves through the system into aquatic systems and it can have a, a eutrophication effect, even at those very, very low rates. And that's, there's been quite a bit of ecology done to verify that. Where it has most impact is in, in aquatic systems. And uh, like I said, ecologists have been studying this for about 20 years, and it's pretty clear that there's an ammonia impact in the park. The big question is, who's responsible for this ammonia impact? Is it really livestock, or is it more complicated than that? That's the big question, what we call source apportionment. If we took our bucket and we had some magical way to fingerprint all the nitrogen molecules in our bucket, where was the origin of all those nitrogen molecules? Okay. We really don't know, and it's really a big source of uncertainty. Now, when people got really interested in this at the beginning, the first thing they looked at was the ammonia inventory for Colorado. And on the right, you see the ammonia inventory for the counties just along the Front Range. And not surprisingly, livestock accounts for most of the ammonia, the largest segment of ammonia, with the, with the crops being right in there behind it. But there are other sources. And the problem is that a lot of people, I think, early on said, oh, this pie chart corresponds with the nitrogen that's coming down in the park. It's livestock that are responsible for most of the nitrogen that's landing in the park. And that's simply not the case, and there's a lot of good science to say that. Because just because you emit nitrogen in one part of the state doesn't mean that it's coming down at the same rate in other places. Okay, so there was this sort of disconnect between uh, where we had to do some science-based education. But there is definitely a concern. This is a map showing the, our livestock operations, confined feeding operations, both feedlots and dairies along the front range. See Denver down there where we are now, and you, then you can see the blue circle over there where we're doing a lot of work in Rocky Mountain National Park. And you've got about 600 uh, 1,000 head feeding capacity or dairy capacity within about 110 miles of the park. 110 miles is not very far when you're thinking atmospheric transport. Okay. So different than water quality and soil issues, management decisions that are made, being made at feedlots and dairies out at Fort Morgan or, or uh, Greeley, Colorado can affect ammonia emissions and have a very rapid impact on, on the park if you happen to have the right transport processes. And, you know, when we first started working in Colorado, a lot of the producers, you would go out and visit with them and they'd say, well, I don't know why this is such a problem because the wind never blows toward the mountains anyway. You know, the jet streams from west to east, right? The wind always blows away from the park. Uh, well, you start looking at the historical record and actually starting in the spring, there's a shift in the prevailing wind and during some of, many of the summer months, the prevailing wind is from east to west. Okay, so there are a lot of a lot of uh, uh, ways that air can move uh, nitrogen up into the park from our livestock systems. But it's fun, you know, you go out, you talk to a dairyman that's had a dairy for 30 years right along the front range and you talk to them about wind directions and they haven't really ever really paid that much attention to it. And uh, you kind of have to convince them that, oh, maybe this is an issue. Now the Park Service was really interested in this source apportionment issue. 
Because if you want to try to address nitrogen deposition in Rocky Mountain National Park, you really need to know where the nitrogen is coming from. Because, right, you don't want to either unfairly regulate someone that's really not that big of a contributor. At the same time, you do want to try to look at the stronger sources. Well, there was a big study done called Romans, and this work even continues now. And it's a really huge report, a very, very nice report. But what it showed, and we won't go into the details, you see the source apportionment graph there. And I won't go through all the details of that. What I want you to recognize is when they did studies, both measurements and modeling, it turned out to be a really complicated picture. That nitrogen was just coming from many, many different sources, probably entering the park. Yes, some from northeast Colorado, especially in the spring and summer. But there was a lot of sources, even from out of state. California gets implicated again, okay, as a significant source of nitrogen. And so this was good for producers, I think. And it was a, you know, a good example of where more contemporary science-based information came in and showed it's not just livestock. It's not just northeastern Colorado. It's a really complicated picture. And I think this has been helpful uh, in that it's, you know, taken a little bit of the uh, focus off ag. Although there's still lots of debate about this graph. Still, it's, it's interesting when the Roman scientists give talks, the thing that they always mention as being the, is, is livestock as being the, the real culprit. So there's sort of this mindset that it's got to be all these feedlots and dairies out here that, that are contributing. Now this is some of our own wet deposition data from our own samplers up in the park. The main thing I wanted you to see here was that nitrogen deposition from the air is kind of episodic. Okay, it's not like a little teeny amount of nitrogen is falling on the park every day. You have to have this transport up into the park and then a precipitation event of some sort to mainly to get it down on, onto the ground. And you can see there's different forms of nitrogen, both ammonium, which is probably coming from our livestock and ag systems, but nitrate, which is probably coming from combustion sources, and organic in, which is still, there's still lots of uncertainty where that's coming from. Now this organic in, interestingly enough, you see the blue bar is very significant across this graph. This is not part, was not part of the nitrogen reduction plan. Okay, they weren't, nobody's ever really been measuring this much. And so that organic end's probably coming from forest fires and things of that sort, probably not much of an ag source. So when you look at it again, right, it, it, we're bringing science-based information into the argument, and again, it's showing that it's not just ag, okay, it's, it's combustion sources, it's this other organic nitrogen sources which are interesting. So again, it's an example of how the bringing science can, can uh, change the scope of the discussion a little bit. I want to finish by talking a little bit about measurements, modeling, and BMPs. And, and there's going to be a lot of papers on this over the next uh, few days. I was really impressed with the program that was put together. And uh, something that, that I work on a lot is, is just measuring environmental parameters for the producers and letting them make their own adjustments. And I really like the, the Peter Drucker quote, or it was attributed to him often, what gets measured gets managed. And we all know that that's got some intuitive wisdom to it. You know, even in our own lives, if we start weighing ourselves every day or not tracking something in our lives, we'll oftentimes change our habits, okay? And a lot of time when it comes to these air quality issues for producers, they do not really have a lot of information to go on. Okay, and so I think there are a lot, there's a big need for improved measurements. And sometimes, almost, it seems like the biggest impact we can have with producers and getting them to change practices is just to go out and measure things or give them a way to measure it themselves and let them come up with innovative solutions. Because livestock producers don't like losing nitrogen from their system, right? It's a valuable resource. And so uh, they just intuitively want to conserve it. In fact, sometimes I give talks like this to producers and that's the first thing they want to find out is like, how can I keep more nitrogen in my manure system, right? They're not so worried about Rocky Mountain National Park or air quality. They're just upset that they're losing so much of their nitrogen into the air, okay? So it's that sort of, you can come at it from two different angles. We do a lot of research on measurements at CSU, and we're certainly not going to have much time to talk about some of these things. But we take measurements. We do what a lot of research groups do, try to do some modeling, and we develop new technologies. And I want to talk just to briefly talk about sort of the key BMPs that producers can do to reduce emissions. Because, yes, there is 
clear evidence that the that the picture along the front range is complicated and that livestock are not the only issue. But still, our producers are under a lot of scrutiny to reduce ammonia is, is, uh, emissions uh, because of the Rocky Mountain National Park scenario. So one of the top ones on my list, and I think the low-hanging fruit, is feed management. Because that's the problem with beef systems and, and dairy systems as well in many cases, as, as, and, and swine too. You just Once you get a lot of uh, uh, nitrogen on the surface, either on a pen surface or in a freestall barn, or even in a lagoon, you get a lot of exposed ammonium to the atmosphere rapidly. There's just not much you can do about it. It's really hard to stop volatilization from happening. We go out and measure ammonia emissions from urine patches from feedlot cattle that are out in the pen. And I mean, right after you know they urinate, they you just lose huge amounts of ammonia really rapidly. Okay, and it's you know how can you do manure management or anything else to stop that? You can't. So. This is where feed management comes in, and we've been doing some research on that, and I know that uh, Sean Archibak and others are going to talk about this uh, during the conference, how changes in nutrient feed management for the animal, especially reducing crude protein, using some other pharmaceuticals could re can reduce excreted nitrogen. And I think this is an area where there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. And uh, certainly changes in manure management can have a big impact in many cases. We're also developing a meteorological warning system. And the idea here is that uh, uh, let's have producers avoid certain activities when air transport is toward Rocky Mountain National Park. So if we can forecast air movements ahead of time and warn them, you know, we can say, don't clean pens, clean manure out of your pens on these, or don't turn your compost pile, or don't apply lagoon effluent through your center pivot tomorrow, because all that ammonia is going to head right toward the park. When I first introduced this meteorological warning idea, um, I didn't think the producers would like it because, you know, you're telling them what to do, right? They hate that. Oh, you can't do this on this day or don't try not to do it on this day. Wait three days. But actually, we got a really positive response, and I think it's because they don't have to invest in new equipment. They don't have to change the way they're doing things. They just have to change the timing at which they do things. And it's a little bit different way to address an environmental issue. We're saying you don't have to necessarily reduce your total ammonia emissions into the air. We just want you to change the timing, try to change the timing of how that happens so that it lowers the environmental impact. Because if we're sending three pounds per acre of ammonia out to uh, eastern Colorado, Kansas, and Nebraska, the corn growing belt out there, they're probably happy to get our, our uh, uh, nitrogen, right? We, you won't even notice three pounds per acre per year. And then finally, we're trying to develop a lot of new measurement technologies. And this is a, a, a top area for us. On back to the feed management thing, just real quickly. It's pretty remarkable how much, um, if you change the crude protein of a diet in a beef, uh, a beef feedlot animal, how much it affects ammonia emissions from the pen surface. Uh, we've done work on this and others have. If you reduce the crude protein, for example, from more of a feedlot standard diet from 13 and a half, to, uh, to maybe 11.6, sometimes we see 40, 25 to 40 percent reductions of ammonia emissions from the pen surface. So the question is, well, does that affect growth of the animal, right? And uh, in some cases it does, in some cases it doesn't. So this is where the animal science scientists are, we're going to have to work more closely with them uh, to, to figure this out. But obviously this teeny change in diet has this really large effect on ammonia emissions from the pen surface. So a really important factor. And of course the distiller's grain issue, I know that's going to be discussed here at the conference, is a really big one because when people start feeding distiller's grain, which a lot of feedlots do now, it increases a crude protein percentage in the diet and it exacerbates the ammonia emission issue. And I know that Rick Todd and Andy Cole have worked on that. I think we'll talk about that today or tomorrow. So again, policy, Diet, markets, all that's affecting, affecting the ammonia issue. So what about new measurement technologies? Um, you know, our group has a, a lot of expensive instruments, uh, like a lot of research groups do, where we can go out and pull our trailer with $200,000 worth of stuff on it up to a feedlot and take a measurement at one point.
for a couple of weeks or however much resources we have to invest in that. And that's always been a huge concern. It's very useful and very informative, but it's always been a big concern for me because we, we all know there's tremendous spatial variability in our livestock systems and there's a lot of temporal variability, a lot of seasonality. Things change, people change diets, people make management decisions based on markets. You, you need more of a continuous multinodal sampling scheme for the air. Uh, if, if you want to hand producers information that they can use to make changes, you need something different than these uh, $200,000 instruments. You know, one of my friends in micrometeorology says um, uh, his students uh, rate each of their instruments by how many Porsche cars they can buy with each one. You know, oh, that's our two Porsche instrument. Uh, and, you know, that's, again, great for research, not great for actually helping producers make management changes. So we wanted to develop new technology to identify ammonia hotspots, uh, give producers a way to track trends and, and emissions, and give them more real-time information for decision-making. And also we're very concerned that ammonia is going to become a more regulated pollutant, okay? If you follow this... Someone sues the EPA almost every year uh, asking that ammonia emissions from livestock be more regulated, okay, in some sense. And a lot of people uh, that are more on the know with, with regulatory developments think that it's just a matter of time before ammonia emissions from livestock systems becomes a more regulated pollutant. How that's all going to play out, we don't know, but producers are going to need tools to deal with it and tools that are economically feasible, okay, that don't put an additional economic burden on them. And that may mean that they have on-site measurement technology. They may have to monitor property line ammonia, for example, as part of the regulatory scheme. We don't know, but that's something that may be coming. So we recently got a new grant called Robotics for Managing Air Emissions of Ammonia at Livestock, in this, at livestock Operations, and this is part of the National Robotics Initiative, which National Science Foundation funded, and um, USDA uh, is a co-sponsor of, and we got funding through them. Uh, it's going to be fun to go to some of the investigator meetings with this because these, a lot of these proposals that were in here, you know, were proposals to do heart surgery and, and uh, proposals to uh, assemble robots, you know, self-driving cars. So it's going to be fun to give my talk mixed in with those. I think, you know. <laughs> Uh, uh, robots for heart surgery, robots for manure. So what do we mean by that? When we say robotics, we're talking about just automated systems to collect information about their environment, transferring that from machine to a person, and then maybe making, helping them make management decisions or maybe automatically doing that. So we're developing a lot of new technology for that. One of my colleagues on this grant is an um, uh, uh, expert in low-cost laser development. We're developing really, really low-cost lasers for measuring ammonia in, in feedlots and dairies. And we're also working with a, a lot of different meteorologists on, again, predicting when we're going to have transport toward the park. And we've also got a big sociological component to this grant. We, we're fortunate at CSU we have one of the top sociologists in the country that knows sort of the psychology of when people will adopt a technology or a agricultural people will adopt a BMP. So how are you going, you know, it's fine to develop BMPs, but how are you going to get them to use it? It's, it's a, as we all know, it's a waste of time to develop some kind of technology or protocol that they won't use. So that's going to be an integral part of it. These are just a few picks. We've got a talk later today where we go through all this. These are some of our early developments where we're trying to develop these wireless sensor technologies. And we compare these really low cost, something that costs $250 with something that costs $15,000 and see how we do. And a lot of the time we can do pretty well and we can help the producers identify places in their operation where they have a lot of emissions. We're developing them a lot of ag engineering type issues here. We're using really low cost electronics, the Arduino, which those of you that are interested in the maker movement or or uh, maybe work with uh, students on uh, low-cost microprocessors. We're, we can do all that ourselves now. You know, in the early days, when we wanted to develop new technology for livestock management, we had to work really closely with electrical engineers, for example. Now we, we don't. We can just do it ourselves. It's really quite remarkable. 
we can set these up at dairies and uh, feed lots and look at ammonia emissions from different parts of the operation and uh, year round or on a seasonal basis and this is a, a very helpful to the producer and helping us learn how to use this technology and this just shows this was some work we did at a beef feedlot uh, where we're testing some of the systems and you can see these really high ammonia emission concentrations I mean these are two-week averages and we're up up, up at uh, 1500 2000 ppb sometimes from some of these systems and we see a lot of variability across different parts of the feedlot look at the background concentrations maybe running at this side around 10 ppb you know when we first started doing a lot of work we did a lot of survey work at waste treatment plants for example because we thought waste treatment plants municipal waste treatment would be a big source of ammonia so we went to denver metro and some of our group worked there took some measurements you know the highest ammonia concentrations we ever see at a you know denver metro treating all the municipal waste from denver area was you know 50 60 ppb highest we ever saw and notice here we're at 2,000. So again, not surprising people look at our livestock systems and say, you've got an issue with ammonia and we'd like for you to see, do something about it. There is a lot of uh, developments going on with, um, in technology that I think have tremendous application in, in a lot of our work. And one of the things is called the Internet of Things, or you see this IoT. What does that mean if you're not familiar? The Internet of Things means when we very first started seeing information on the World Wide Web, and still to this day, most of that information, when you retrieve something from the web, it's information that was put on there by a human, right? It was some information that somebody assimilated and posted, and you can, you can get it. With the Internet of Things, it's, now we have sensors and machines that are connected to the Internet and automatically just put, post information on the Internet. And if you get enough information, you develop sort of an ambient intelligence around that, uh, where you can make broader inferences. And Cisco is one of the leaders in that, at least from a commercial point of view. And they use livestock as an example. This is their big poster that they post everywhere. And down at the bottom, they're talking about the Spark group out of, um, I believe it's a Dutch group, and how they're putting sensors in the animals, in their operations, and connecting those to the Internet and allowing the producers to use it. It's interesting that one of the first places the Internet of Things really became really um, significant was in air quality monitoring. And the, both air casting and the air quality egg, which are really fascinating, if you're interested in this stuff, go check it out. It shows that if you get enough people measuring air quality around the world, you can start making these more bigger inferences. And they're small, low-cost technologies that can, that can accomplish these things. Really interesting stuff. Uh, sometimes along with the Internet of Things, you'll see machine-to-machine -machine or machine-to-man uh, communications or M2M. Watch for that stuff too. And again, a lot of this is now being applied to livestock. They use these as examples. Um, the Economist published a big article on it. This was the big picture that the Economist used down here in the lower right to highlight their article on the Internet of Things. This, uh, this idea that dairy systems can really benefit from being all the information from all the animals and all the feed system and all the manure system and waste handling system is all being loaded to the cloud and available for the manager to use. So people in this room, there's going to be a lot of opportunities over the next 20 years to really learn how to use this technology. So I'll wrap up really quick because I know we need to get moving to the next sessions, but I think the conclusions are that livestock ammonia and manure management is definitely a global issue and is going to be continually pointed at uh, as uh, earth system scientists and international policy makers look at the nitrogen issue. The Front Range of Colorado is sort of a test case for how science policy and cooperation among the stakeholders can address these regional issues. And it's, I encourage you to come to the air quality sessions uh, that follow because there's going to be a bunch of talks on how this has been a success. And then finally, I think there's lots of opportunities to develop new measurement technologies and uh, use some of this new Internet of Things uh, in all of our work. And so again, thanks for coming to Colorado and, and come back and visit this summer and depending on what day you come, we'll either go collect some manure or we'll go fishing. So, all right. Thank you. Right. I think there is some uh, organic matter in the in the particulates, but there's also, you know, just a bunch of other 
more biogenic compounds, a lot of like um, um, isoprenes, amines, a bunch of interesting things. You know, you, we, they're running this stuff through a mass spec now, trying to figure out what is making up that organic component. It was a bit of a surprise. This is kind of a new development. Um, and the atmospheric chemists that work on this are still trying to figure out what, what forms that organic intakes and, um, and its origin. So we think a lot of it's forest uh, combustion related. So it probably is not an ag source. But we don't know for sure. Jay, could you uh, repeat the question? When yeah, the, the, it's a good question. The question is, you know, yeah, if we reduce ammonia emissions from our systems, it's going, you're going to build up ammonia probably, and other, other forms of nitrogen in the system are probably going to increase. And, um, you know, producers pick up on that right away. What if I reduce my ammonia emissions, but am I going to increase runoff or water? Am I going to reduce air quality impacts, but increase water quality impacts? And so, um, that's, that's a problem. I think the, the positive thing is that is once you lose something into the air, you have absolutely no control over it all. And I think the idea is that if you can keep that nitrogen uh, in the manure pack or somewhere in the manure system, at least it gives you more management options to try to do something with it instead of just losing it to the atmosphere and having it leave your site completely. So, but you're right. We all know that, right? You make an improvement in one environmental area, but you'll cause an unexpected consequence uh, with greenhouse gases or runoff or something like that. So you're right. You have to treat the system as a whole, and that's an important, important part. Last question. Back in the 60s, there was a lot of good work uh, looking at dry deposition into water bodies. Are, are you measuring dry deposition into water bodies? And if so, how do you do that? The question is, yeah, what about dry deposition? And notice in some of those graphs I showed, most of the impact is wet deposition, but there is significant dry deposition. And that's been very poorly monitored on a national scale. We don't know as much about that, but there's a new air monitoring network called AMON, part of the NADP system. And it is estimating dry deposition now. So we've, that has just gotten started, and there's a network across the United States that's really ramping up. So we are going to have more dry deposition measurements. And it's a harder thing to calculate. There's more uncertainty than the wet deposition. But if you're interested in that, I really encourage you to look at this AMON network, because they're starting to post numbers. And what it shows is that not only do we have increased nitrogen deposition in Rocky Mountain National Park, we have it all along the whole western part of the United States. And producers, of course, are quick to point that out. Well, you've got a lot of nitrogen deposition up here in other areas where there are no livestock. So what's the deal with that? Why are we getting our fingers pointed at us? So um, I think, you know, this point that somebody made about organic in and dry deposition, you have to look at all the forms of nitrogen coming down, not just wet deposition of ammonium, which was sort of the, what they've been sort of really focused on. And so, again, bringing science-based information to that is, is, I think, taking a little bit of the focus off producers. So it's been, been good. All right. I think that was an outstanding talk. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you.